hello and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Campana. I am an assistant professor here of Japanese literature and media in the Department of Asian Studies here at Cornell. And I'm really thrilled to be welcoming you all to today's talk by Professor Rachel Hutchinson of the University of Delaware, which is entitled uh, Japanese Video Games as Cultural Artifacts. Uh, this talk is sponsored by the East Asia program and supported by the new East Asia Plus initiative at Cornell that combines programming like this, uh, mentorship and digital publishing around East Asian media studies and digital humanities. Thank you in particular to Professor Andrea Bachner, the director of the East Asia program, Dr. Joshua Young, the program manager, and especially to Amala Lane, the program initiatives and media coordinator. I also want to shout out another fantastic EAP sponsored lecture happening later this week, uh, this Friday at April 22nd at 4.45 PM. Uh, Professor Jennifer Robertson of the University of Michigan will be giving a talk called Robosexism, Gendering AI and Robots. So anyone here uh, likely has some overlapping interests with that one. So that will be a hybrid talk, both on Zoom and in person here at Cornell. So I highly encourage you to attend. Um, so. Uh, the way this will work is uh, if you could keep your audio and video muted until the Q&A afterwards, uh, uh, feel, please feel free to turn your video on. Um, and we'll, we could have Q&A Q in two different media, whatever you're comfortable with. You can put your question in the chat and we'll read them out loud, or you could raise your digital hand and I'll call on you so you can ask it uh, through voice. Um, so uh, I'd just like to introduce Professor Hutchinson. Uh, game studies is still a fairly young field, but Despite the vast majority of video games for so much of the medium's history being developed in Japan, the intersection between game studies and Japan studies has remained until quite recently pretty shockingly rare, to be honest. Um, Professor Hutchinson has had an enormous part of changing that with her groundbreaking work at the intersection between games and Japan. She's a leader in the field who has changed the landscape of the conversation of being held like few others have. Uh, Professor Hutchinson has written two wonderful books, the first called uh, Nagai Kafu's Occidentalism, Defining the Japanese Self from 2011, and the second being Japanese Culture Through Video Games in 2019, which in the brief amount of time it's been out uh, has already become pretty much the central text on games from a Japan studies perspective. It touches on games in relation to topics as diverse as identity, ethnicity, war, and anxieties around nuclear technology, my personal favorite chapter is a tour de force exploration of Japanese role-playing games that starts off with the question of why do all these protagonists have dead parents? Uh, and it links these game texts to socioeconomic shifts in this era and the dizzyingly diverse range of novels and films and TV shows and anime and teen subcultures and social theory from Japan at the time that dealt with these questions of youth, violence, and the breakdown of the conventional family system. It's really something else. Uh, she's also a prolific anthology editor, having edited and co-edited Representing the Other in Modern Japanese Literature, Negotiating Censorship in Modern Japan, The Rutledge Handbook of Modern Japanese Literature, and very excitingly and relevant to today's topic, Japanese role-playing games, genre, representation, and liminality in the JRPG, which just came out as an ebook a few days ago and will be released in hard back next month, in which she also has a wonderful chapter on representations of blindness in Final Fantasy XV. Uh, this is an exciting time for game studies, including at Cornell, uh, with more interest in the field among faculty and graduate and undergraduate students than ever before. Uh, many of us here are part of this growing movement, and more game studies courses are being developed here than ever. On a personal level, from the perspective of my own work and teaching, this wouldn't have been possible without Professor Hutchinson's example and her wonderful research, some of which she'll be sharing with us today. I'd like to thank her once more and warmly welcome her to Cornell. Well, thank you very much for that uh, very kind and, and thoughtful introduction. Um, I'm very honoured to be here at Cornell uh, for this lecture, and I'd really like to thank uh, Professor Andrew Campagna for uh, inviting me here today. I'm going to share my screen, and hopefully this will work. Ah, oh. <laughs> there we are. I'm supposed to be on this slide. Uh, can you see that? Andrew, yes. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, Japanese video games as cultural artifacts. Um, these are the two books um, that Professor Campana mentioned. Um, and in these books, I'm interested in a couple of questions. How do we learn 
about culture when we're playing video games? Or I guess flipping that around, do we even, is it possible to learn about culture when we're playing video games? And, and I think yes. Um, and I'd like to talk about that today. And all of my case studies are going to be games from Japan. Um, so here are some things that you might find in a course on Japanese culture. Uh, we've got Natsume Soseki's Kokoro, Kurosawa Akira's film Rashomon, Miyazaki Hayao's Ponyo, the animated film up there, uh, Tezuka Osamu's manga Astro Boy, uh, there's a ukiyo-e woodblock print down there and also a ceramic teacup. Uh, so what we learn from these things is uh, the aesthetic values of a place that's not our own. Uh, we learn what Japanese people think is good or beautiful or useful. We learn about important places, times in history and anxieties felt by people who live there. Uh, anxiety about the role of the individual in society, for example. Uh, the value of truth, how to grow up and assert yourself as a free agent, and what basically makes us human. And just as this wonderful novel Kokoro captured the anxiety of living in Meiji Japan in 1914, I would argue, and I argue in my book, um, that Final Fantasy VII does the same thing um, for 1997 when it came out. Uh, Natsume Soseki was a really popular author. His books were uh, serialized in the Asahi Shinbun, the newspaper in Tokyo, and they really captured the essence of the times. And in the same way, I think that the big classics of the Japanese role-playing game genre, the JRPG, are popular entertainment narratives that take on some really big questions like social anxiety, and as we just heard, absent parents, um, nuclear anxiety, um, anxiety about bioethics and war memory. And I think that both the novel and the JRPG can give us a lot of insight into the context of Japanese culture. So there are a few ways which I think we can use uh, video games to learn about Japanese culture uh, through the character design, the background setting or the environment of the game, its aesthetic style, its thematic content and the game dynamics and goals. So I want to briefly look at each of these today. Starting with character design, a lot of JRPGs feature main characters that look like this. Uh, big hair, uh, blue eyes usually, a slim build but very muscular, uh, big swords and interesting clothing design. This is Cloud Strife from Final Fantasy VII that I just showed you. And on the left we can see him in concept art. I'll just get rid of a pop-up that's in the middle of my screen. There we are. Um, and on the right, that's how he actually appeared in the game in 1997. Those of you playing the remake might be a bit shocked by that appearance, but that's what he looked like in 3D polygon rendering. Uh, this is Titus from Final Fantasy X in 2001. And this is Noctus from Final Fantasy 15 a couple of years ago. And this one is Sora from Kingdom Hearts. And they all look pretty similar, right? Uh, that's because they were all designed by the same person, Nomura Tetsuya, and they all draw on the same conventions of Japanese character design that we see in manga, uh, that's comic books from Japan, and also anime or animation. This figure is the shonen, the youth. Um, this is a young man on the verge of becoming an adult. The big spiky hair shows his dynamism, his get up and go, uh, his readiness to get out into the world and make something of himself. And um, this kind of character has been pretty constant from the Meiji period, actually, uh, ever since Samuel Smiles' book, Self Help, was published in the Meiji era. And that book really extolled the virtues of what they used to call Rishin Shusset standing on your own two feet and getting out into the world and making something of yourself, contributing to society and so on. And the, the great tension in all of these games here is that um, this sounds like a lot of work, right? These are young people, they wanna play, uh, they wish they were still a child in many ways and yet they're becoming an adult. And so they have some, uh, very often they have deep psychological problems and the hero has to adjust to their place in the world and try to define their identity 
as they go forward. And in the case of Cloud and Titus, um, this is a real mission for the game. It's a big part of gameplay for you to help them find out their identity because they've lost their memory. A lot of these JRPG characters have amnesia. Uh, they don't know who they are. And it's your job as the player uh, to help them find it, that out. Moving over to the fighting game genre, uh, character design is really important to quickly establish which country the character comes from and what kind of fighting style they have. Each character is incredibly stereotyped. Um, so you have the Kung Fu master, uh, the nunchuck fighter, the short sword Greek goddess, the ninja warrior, uh, the samurai, and so on. And on my screen, I've got some things that are kind of covering up the slide, um, but I hope that you can see this is from Soul Calibur uh, 2. Um, and this, uh, this Soul Calibur series comes from Namco Bandai. Um, I use this game to teach about representations of race and gender and sexuality in Japanese video games. And one of the most interesting characters is this guy in the middle here, uh, Mitsurugi Heishiro, the samurai um, from Soul Edge. So he appears right from the start of the series on the left. This is how he appeared in the original arcade cabinet game uh, Soul Edge. Um, Mitsurugi really does embody the Japanese self in this series. He's privileged over and above all the other characters, even though they're all supposed to be evenly balanced in terms of their uh, fighting ability and so on. Uh, he's always the player one default character in Soul Edge. Um, he plays a very large role in attract mode. That's the cinematics that the cabinet plays uh, when nobody's playing the game. So it's trying to attract people to come and play it. You see him a lot in those cinematics. Uh, he features in the cabinet art, uh, the cover art of the console games, and also um, the opening scenes of, of all the games. And Mitsurugi's uh, basic elements are pretty much consistent. You can see he's got the top knot. He looks like a Ronin. He looks kind of like um, Mifune Toshiro from the Kurosawa movies. And we saw a picture of Rashomon earlier. Uh, and he looks like that. He's got the katana sword. Uh, he's wearing his tubby socks and, and so on. Um, but the iconography of Mitsurugi Heishiro gets more... Japanese, more nationalistic over time. Uh, you see in the first picture, uh, he's kind of got this vaguely oriental look in terms of the, the colouring of the palette, the pattern on his pants and what have you. Over here in Soul Calibur 3, we've got this sort of uh, pattern on his pants that looks like dragons. So it's more kind of vaguely orientalized, but you do get more red in the costume uh, over time. Uh, mirroring the red of the Japanese flag. We have this rope around his waist, which looks like a Nawa rope from uh, Shinto iconography. Um, the dragons give way over time. There's more dragons there. Um, this is Soul Calibur 4. I think the, the rope is more prominent here. But by the time you get to Soul Calibur 5, um, if you look at the necklace that he's wearing, that is more, even more Shinto iconography there. It's like something that a priest would wear, but much bigger uh, for visual effect. But on his um, clothing here, we've actually got some kind of Buddha uh, figure, uh, which I thought was really interesting. So you get this mix of Shinto and Buddhist imagery over time. Now, what I find really interesting about Mitsurugi is the character select screen. This is from Soul Calibur 2, and it's selecting Ivy at the moment. But if you look at all the people that are um, listed for you to choose, uh, Mitsurugi appears up here in the top left. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I'm putting my cursor over his face. Um, so he's up in the top left. Now, even though the default characters are different, uh, from this game onwards, Mitsurugi is always up there in the top left. So he's always the first one that you see as your eye kind of carries across from player one um, over to the other side of the screen. This kind of privileging of the main Japanese male character can also be seen in Virtua Fighter, 
with Akira Yuki, in Tekken with Kazuya Mishima and later Jin Kazama, and also in Street Fighter with Liu. Here we are in Street Fighter, and you've got Liu here. He's Japanese, and he has the default player one position there. Uh, Liu is also featured very heavily in the cabinet art. This is a very famous um, Capcom poster of Liu. And you see on the original cabinet there, uh, the poster is replicated on the side. The side of the cabinet faces the street. Um, so when you're walking past the uh, arcade, um, that acts as a um, attract magnet, some marketing for the game to draw you in. Um, so Liu is that attraction there. Um, on Virtua Fighter 2, we have Akira Yuki on the side. And what's really interesting about this cabinet is that he's on both sides of the cabinet, the left and the right. Um, usually, you know, you'll have Ryu on one side and Ken on the other or something like that. But Akira Yuki is on both sides. And you see him, uh, this is Virtua Fighter. So it was the first um, 3D polygon fighter. And you can see the 3D polygon figures here. Uh, and that's him right in the front. Um, and so you can see again with Kazuya Mishima in the first Tekken on the PlayStation, his giant chest dominates the, the front of that game. Um, and he's uh, replaced by Jin Kazama, his son, over time. This is a poster for Tekken 3 and you see him in Tekken 5 right down the front there. Um, so again and again, over and over, we get this normative Japanese male figure being placed in the central position in the Japanese fighting game. And by studying the characteristics of these people, we can tell what's valued, what's seen as normative uh, in Japanese society. We can also learn a lot about Japanese culture uh, from how the set designs are put together. Uh, this is actually Mitsurugi's associated stage set in Soul Calibur. This is the Sakura Dai Gate at Kaminoi Castle in the game narrative. And this kind of iconography comes straight from Japanese architecture and garden aesthetics, with the cherry blossom symbolizing the ephemeral nature of life, especially for the young soldier or samurai cut down in their prime. Cherry blossoms bloom fully and then they float away on the wind, uh, which is very beautiful and fleeting. Uh, they don't hang around to wither on the tree. Uh, so the message here is really to live life to the full while you've got it. And you can see this in Japanese Buddhism, in the aesthetics of ukiyo-e, the floating world as well. So when we talk about Japanese environments in games, it's often this kind of image that comes to mind, right? Another kind of image is the beautiful nature environment. Uh, and this is seen a lot in the JRPG. Here again, we have our friend Cloud <laughs> from Final Fantasy VII, and he's running into a beautiful forest environment. Uh, he's chasing his friend there. Now, uh, this game was really interesting for the 2D painted artwork uh, that formed all the backgrounds. And then on top of that, you had the 3D uh, computer modeled figures kind of superimposed onto it and moving through space. Now, what I want to point out here is the similarity between this kind of background and that found in Miyazaki Hayao's films. The same year, 1997, was when uh, Princess Mononoke came out, right? Uh, and this is a scene from that movie. Uh, very, very similar aesthetic. Uh, this is another beautiful image. Is, is this an anime or a video game? We don't know. Actually, it's a scene from another JRPG. It's um, Nino Kuni, Wrath of the White Witch, uh, that came out from Namco Bandai in 2011. Um, this game was actually developed in direct collaboration with Studio Ghibli. So that was kind of a trick question. Uh, the animation is supposed to look like a Miyazaki film. And so we can learn a lot about what Japanese people value in their environment uh, from the way they depict it in art. So here we have the lush greens, the clear air, bubbling water, huge old growth forest uh, with these big trees dominating the landscape, right? And I think, you know, this shows a reverence for nature, uh, but also perhaps a feeling of loss because now 
uh, you have to travel a fair way in Japan, you know, to find this kind of environment. A lot of people live in a very urban built up space. Um, some of these kinds of games have been analyzed in terms of Shinto practice. And you can see this kind of aesthetic in uh, another big game, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild uh, from Nintendo a few years ago. Uh, certain features that stand out in the environment in this game, like a, a really big rock or a tree or a mountain, have their own little spirits, and they're called Koroks, and here's one waving at us. They're very friendly, and they help you by giving you seeds, and then you can trade those in later for inventory upgrades. So paying, att uh, paying attention to nature uh, helps you, in other words. Uh, the forest people give you weapons that are made out of wood and this is really helpful because in the game uh, lightning can strike you and if you're carrying metal weapons then you can die from this right so the, the wooden weapons really help and if you look at the concept art for this game uh, the margins of the drawings have Stadio Ghibli written in katakana like Studio Ghibli and it was not a direct collaboration like Nino Kuni was, but what they're trying to do is kind of capture that aesthetic, that Princess Mononoke wildness about nature. Um, so this is the, this kind of beautiful nature idea that we find in Japanese games. Um, going the opposite way, there's another way to look at Japanese environments. Um, other scholars have noted that Japanese games really set the standard for how to render 3D environments. So games like this one, this is Resident Evil from 1996, established a certain kind of Japanese look for games. Survival horror games de depend very much on closed in rooms and a very dark palette to produce a gloomy feeling and a, a sense of claustrophobia in the player. So you've got to get out of this place, right? Um, Konami's Fox Engine, developed around the same time. Uh, this is Metal Gear Solid uh, from 1998. Um, this closed in environment produces a similar feeling of dread in the player. So you feel like you have to sneak around and move very quietly in this environment. And that's actually what you have to do in the game. It's a tactical uh, espionage thriller. And so this kind of closed in 3D space is now very familiar to anyone who plays games that have been built using Konami's Fox engine, uh, even though the player might not even realize that the game has Japanese roots. Another way to learn about Japan through environments is through super realistic renderings of the real world. On the left, that is a scene from the game Persona 5 uh, by Atlas. Um, it's based very closely on the real life streets of Shibuya and other suburbs of Tokyo. And on the right, that's actually a shot of the real life equivalent to the game scene that was found by a fan and then posted on Twitter. And there are actually lots of forums and discussion boards where people have gone around and hunted down the real world environment and then posted a picture of it next to a screenshot from the game. And so exploring the environment in this kind of game is sort of like taking a tour of Tokyo without leaving your uh, living room. So it's a virtual tour of the real life Japanese city. So we've seen in our um, character designs and backgrounds how Japanese video games draw on this manga and anime style, these conventions to create a certain kind of look that players associate with Japan and Japanese culture. This is achieved in a different way by 3D rendering, which produces a certain kind of affect or an emotional response in the player. Over time, the early graphics and hand-drawn designs have given way to more photorealistic graphics. So we feel more and more as if we're moving through the real world in the game space. But lastly, just like any other art medium, film, oil paintings, watercolors, sculpture or whatever, uh, there's always gonna be people who wanna express their ideas in a more experimental way and give a unique uh, feeling. And a good example, I can think of here uh, that expresses uh, Japanese art style 
and a strong focus on Japanese culture is Orkami. This was developed by Clover Studio in 2006. It has a unique art style based on hand-drawn characters, environments, and animated sequences. Uh, you can see it, it looks like traditional Japanese ink art. It inc incorporates a lot of calligraphy as well as a lot of uh, religious iconography. The title is a pun. Orkami can mean wolf or God, and you actually play as this white wolf here, that's you. <laughs> and you're the incarnation of the sun goddess, Amaterasu Omikami. Now, uh, Okami uses a lot of the same um, symbolism as other games from Japan. So you see again, the cherry tree and so forth. Uh, but here they're very directly linked to Shinto, as you can see with the big Tori gate on the right. And also there's a white uh, shime nawa rope around the cherry tree itself, which marks it as sacred. In the background behind that, you can see a dead tree on the left. And part of the gameplay is to find dead trees like this and make them bloom, bringing life back to the land. So gameplay also carries out a mission of this feeling of reverence for nature. The environment uses a lot of traditional architecture as well or a pastiche of traditional architecture. Uh, if you go inside this building, uh, you'll find traditional Japanese furniture, uh, you'll find zabuton cushions, musical instruments, teapots, and so on. And you can often go up to uh, objects or items in the game and examine them. You, you push on one of the buttons and a text box appears with an explanation and it'll have a little picture and say samisen, uh, a three stringed instrument used in kabuki plays and things like this. And so you can actually learn quite a lot about Japanese culture just by exploring the environment and going up to objects and, and clicking on them, which is kind of cool. A lot of the story is inspired by the Kojiki, the record of ancient matters published in the eighth century. Uh, and this recounted tales of the ancient gods and legendary heroes. So here on the left, um, this is the character Susano, who's talking. Uh, according to legend, he's the brother of Amaterasu and a fierce warrior who also gets drunk all the time. <laughs> and in the game, uh, he's always after sake, the Japanese rice wine, uh, which is brewed by the young woman Kushi. And you can see her down here on the right. She's standing in the middle of her rice field. And one of your first missions in the game is to fix her water wheel on her mill uh, so she can uh, power her machinery to pound the rice to make the sake for seasonal. So there's a lot of ways in which the aesthetic style of a game uh, can be used to complement its ideology and the content. In my book, I argued that the JRPG can be regarded as the shisho setsu for our era. And this is the eye novel that dominated Japanese literature through the 20th century. Um, and as narrative forms, both of them are pretty long. Uh, the Japanese role playing game can take anywhere from 50 to 100 hours to complete. Orkami actually took me 130. So that was, a, that was a long one. I did everything in that game. Um, but both these artistic forms are concerned with the place of the individual self in society and both explore pressing issues of the day. And you, I argue that you can see this, especially in games of the 1990s, which explore really difficult questions of nuclear power, war memory, colonialism in Asia, bioethics and social breakdown. So I'd like to take one of these as a case study, and uh, that would be bioethics, which I'm really interested in. Um, these are some good games, I think, in which bioengineering and genetic manipulation form a good part of the main story. I think the theme comes across most fully in uh, the longer structures of the role-playing game and action games like Metal Gear Solid. Uh, but you can also see it in fighting games, as well as survival horror. So to start with Final Fantasy VI, um, this is a game that is full of genetic experiments. I'll just move 
came over there. Uh, they're integral to the main plot. The villain Kefka is seen here on the left in this colorful clothing. Uh, he spends most of his time in the game hunting magical creatures called espers, and he uses them to extract magical power. Up here on the right, this is his, um, his Magitech research facility. And he, you can see there's four creatures trapped in these big glass jars. There's one that looks like a horse here, is it probably the clearest one. Um, so these espers are trapped. Uh, Kefka extracts the magic out of these living beings, and then he turns that magic into weapons through the invention of Magitech armor, a wearable suit that emits a powerful blast of light energy out of the chest. And on the, on the bottom here, it says, this is how the emperor, Gestal, can create his invincible army of Magitech soldiers. And what he's doing is creating these soldiers through bioengineering, basically. Uh, Final Fantasy VII um, deals with similar themes. Here on the left, we see the main character Cloud Strife on the floor uh, with his friend Zack, who's helping him up after they have escaped from glowing glass tanks in the basement of the Shinra mansion. And so this, you know, this person trapped in the glass tank idea carries over from Final Fantasy VI into seven. And like Kefka's Magitech factory, the Shinra mansion is a lab for growing super soldiers, infusing them with Mako, which acts a lot like nuclear material. The process gives soldiers a bright blue glow to their eyes. And it's kind of a mystery in the game. We're never quite sure whether Cloud went through this process or not, but he does have these same blue eyes. And a lot of people in the game comment on this. He goes through the whole game. He's completely confused if he's a member of this elite fighting squad or not. It also confuses you, the player. It leads to a very high degree of narrative tension and a very deep immersion in the game world. The scientist Hojo has also experimented on other people, uh, such as Vincent Valentine. He's an optional character you can find in the basement if you follow this hidden note, okay? This is the note that Hojo wrote. And look at the aesthetics here. This is, it looks a lot like Resident Evil in this closed in space. That's what people are talking about, the Japanese look of the mid 1990s. It's not just in survival horror, but it's also in role playing games as well. The Metal Gear Solid series is probably the most obvious narrative about bioethics in the history of video games. It has cloned super soldiers, people being turned into weapons, people with mechanical exoskeletons, uh, people whose blood is replaced with liquid plastic. Uh, it has nanoviruses, people kept in suspended animation so their cells can be used and uh, copied. Uh, there's a human surrogate mother to a clone army and all of it is paid for by the military industrial complex. <laughs> and I don't wanna to give too much away, but one of the main genetic experiments of the series is this program known as Les Enfants Terribles, uh, where children are grown from cells. And, and so this, this series more than any other really explores all the various aspects of bioengineering and the military from every possible angle. And it's a fascinating series if you ever have the, the time uh, to go through it. The games are quite long. Um, moving over to the short form <laughs> games, the, the fighting series games in Tekken, Jin Kazama carries the devil gene. And this is inherited from his grandmother Kazumi uh, through his father Kazuya. And in Japanese, it's called uh, Devil's Blood, Deberu no Chi, the Devil Factor, or Devil's Power. It's never really clearly explained what this devil gene is or where it came from. But one thing is for sure the Mishima Zaibatsu and the G Corporation both want access to its power. The devil gene is manipulated by G Corp in cellular experiments, trying to create stronger human hybrids. Part of this mission is known as the Genocell program. 
And G Corp has uh, bioengineering facilities in Nepal and also in Nebraska. And now and then through the game series, people are kidnapped and taken there uh, to serve as subjects for genetic experimentation. The effect of the devil gene is very clearly seen in depictions of Jin Kazama. Normally, he looks like this, a typical fighter uh, found in games of this genre with a fierce aspect to his face, a hypermuscular body, uh, and so on. But when the devil gene switches on, here we go, his head sprouts horns, large black wings appear on his back, and the irises of his eyes become yellow in colour. This change is reflected in the gameplay dynamics. Uh, since Jin has different attacks in battle when the um, devil gene is activated. Lastly, uh, in this sequence, I'd like to consider Resident Evil. Um, this is one of the earliest survival horror games from Japan, and the original title there, Biohazard, or Biohazard, indicates the biological concerns of the narrative. In this game, the Umbrella Corporation uh, is a pharmaceutical company, but it's also a secret genetic engineering enterprise. We have more corporate bioengineering to create the ultimate bioweapon. In this game, it's called Tyrant. And of course, there's a huge disaster uh, releasing in, uh, resulting in the release of biological mutagens called an infection known as the T virus. When mutated cells arise in a living organism, it is called an infection. And the game is really interesting to me because it looks at uh, the infection of both humans and animals. And this is a great excuse for gameplay to have the player character surrounded by infected, you know, scorpions or, or snakes or dogs or whatever horrible animals the, the game designers can come up with. Um, but it looks at how pathogens pass between species. In the end, the only solution is atomic destruction and Raccoon City is completely obliterated. So taking these games as a set, there's actually a lot of commonalities between them. All of them have corporate bioengineering with government collusion. Everybody's trying to create some kind of super soldier through genetic manipulation uh, and or bioweapons. Um, People use the bodies of dead soldiers or dead fighters for their cells to try and create more uh, super soldiers out of those cells. And in Japan, this is particularly abhorrent um, because, you know, in, in Buddhist uh, philosophy, the body has to be uh, kept whole after death. So if you harvest cells from somebody, uh, you're preventing um, their body from uh, reincarnating as a whole being in, in the afterlife. Um, so we're also experimenting on live subjects through these games. Uh, in Final Fantasy VI, uh, Kefka experiments on Terra, and in Final Fantasy VII, the Shinra Corporation experiments on Cloud. Uh, and the people behind all these experiments are these horrible, mad scientists. This is William Birkin from uh, Resident Evil 2. And as, as you see, he's kind of uh, met a fitting end. He's mutated uh, himself. Um, but Kefka and Hojo are also, you know, these, these horrible, uh, mad scientists. Um, What's interesting about that is that Kefka and Hojo uh, mutate into different physical forms. You have to fight them in the game sequences and uh, their physical form mutates and changes. So you have to battle against them in different forms. Uh, this game dynamic was a feature of Final Fantasy and also Dragon Quest uh, from their inception. But I think here it um, serves a very definite narrative purpose. We see a judgment and a bias against the scientists. And the narratives on the whole are generally negative. They're set against the whole idea of bioengineering for military use. When you look at the dates of the games I'm talking about, they all converge more or less around the year 1996. This was the year in which Dolly the sheep was cloned. 
Um, and this sparked a great deal of discussion over bioengineering and cloning worldwide. I really remember it at the time. Um, some saw this as the culmination of research that had been intensifying through the 1990s. Uh, it was seen as a miracle of human creation. Others saw it as unethical, as humans shouldn't be tampering with the natural world. Uh, Dolly's health was followed obsessively in the media and whenever she, you know, coughed or something, whenever she um, proved herself to be not 100% healthy, many saw this to be proof that bioengineering was unethical and immoral. In Japan and other Asian countries, as I, as I mentioned earlier, this anxiety was compounded by the Buddhist conviction that a person's body should remain whole and untampered with, both in life and after death. Right. So all these games converge around 1996. I think this provides a discourse on bioethics in mid 1990s Japan. And what's interesting to me is that if you look at the technology and the hardware of video games at this time, this is also when the SNES or Super Nintendo was being pushed to its absolute limits uh, with Final Fantasy VI, and the new PlayStation console for Final Fantasy VII uh, was used to generate new kinds of graphics and action capabilities. So this kind of brings us to the specifics of discourse in the video game medium. How is this kind of discourse different to anything that we might find in literature or film, for example? ideology in games is put forward in a number of different ways. The most obvious way is through representation, the narrative, what you see on the screen and what happens in the story, the themes of the game. These elements are common to literature, film, manga, anime, all kinds of narrative texts. But games are also coded sets of rules that can be used by the game designers to put forward their ideas, their values, attitudes and beliefs in different ways. Um, as Gonzalo Frasca argued in 2003, games have goal rules, what the player needs to do to win, and manipulation rules, what the player can do and what they can't do in the game. And these both together show the ideology of the game designer. So if we look at Final Fantasy VII, a Metal Gear Solid, for example, the player and the character share the same goal, which is to destroy nuclear weapons, to destroy the reactors, to disarm the weapons and make sure they don't get into the wrong hands. In both games, what's interesting is the player experiences complicity in nuclear accidents. You cause some horrendous accident that you realise is your fault and you've brought it about through your actions in the game. This makes you even more motivated to fight against the nuclear enterprise. You're angry at the game designers for putting you in this horrible position. And so um, you're motivated, right? You're, you want to uh, take down Shinra and the evil uh, terrorists and what have you. The point is though, unlike a book or a film, you can't just watch and let it all unfold. Your success in the game depends on your skill. It depends on the choices that you make as a player. So Cloud and Snake literally cannot progress through the stories unless you are skillful enough to do the tasks in the time provided. And this draws a strong connection between the game world and the real world. And I think this makes the nuclear critique in these games very effective. Games have this kind of embodiment that's lacking in other media. You are in the game and you're the one pushing the narrative forward. And I think that has a really strong impact on people. It certainly makes the narrative stick in your mind afterwards. We can also look at manipulation rules in the games. 
And uh, Metal Gear Solid Five is a fun one. <laughs> Over the course of the series, Snake's physicality shows this bioethics discourse. Uh, he has a great deal of strength and sneaking ability as a result of bioengineering and experiments that have been run on his body. But he also ages extremely quickly and he has a lot of physical limitations because of the problems caused by the cloning process. In Metal Gear Solid 5, um, demon points and hero points act as a kind of karmic system for the game. You acquire hero points by doing positive things like liberating child soldiers, or you can acquire demon points uh, by doing negative things like building a nuclear weapon. In fact, Building a nuclear weapon gives you so many demon points all at once that in many cases, the main character Snake will immediately take on the aspect of a demon with horns, uh, bloodshot eyes and, and yellowish skin. So this tells you that making nukes is not a good idea. Nuclear ide ideology is also expressed in the FOB, the forward operating base. This is a military installation that you can develop as part of a mini game with friends who are also playing online. Uh, this screenshot shows a description of the nuclear weapon in the game. The most powerful weapon, <clears throat> excuse me, of mass destruction humanity has ever created. You can get a trophy. There's two trophies here, right? One of them is called deterrence. Uh, you get that when you create a nuclear weapon. And the other one is called disarmament, which you acquire if you can get rid of a nuclear weapon. Now, there are some benefits to developing a nuclear weapon. It deters other players from considering an attack on your FOB. Uh, the more nuclear weapons a player owns, the less often their base can be invaded by other players. And also the player's PF rank, that's their offensive and defensive ranking against other players, is dramatically increased. On the other hand, developing nuclear weapons is extremely expensive in terms of in-game currency. You see it costs uh, 750000 uh, there to develop it. It uses up all your fuel resources and also your stocks of metals. It takes the player a lot of time, effort and hard won resources to be able to develop these weapons. And most importantly, there is absolutely no capability in the game to actually use nuclear weapons on other players. <laughs> players familiar with the earlier titles wouldn't be surprised by this. The Famitsu official game guide explained that a special hidden ending could be triggered if all players on a specific server disarmed and disposed of their nuclear weapons. The disarmament event of 2015 caused a great deal of online discussion, spurred by press releases from Konami and tweets from the designer Kojima Hideo himself. From November to December 2015, the total number of nuclear weapons owned by gamers across all consoles, that's the PlayStation 3, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Xbox 360 and Steam, decreased by the thousands, with Konami tracking numbers on the official game website each day. Of course, it didn't last. <laughs> uh, the effort is still ongoing. This is a Reddit page called Metal Gear Anti-Nuclear. Um, it has live nuke counts constantly updated across all servers. And these people actively try to dismantle or steal other players' nukes in order to dispose of them at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, funnily enough, a couple of years ago, hackers uh, got in and set all the numbers of nukes to zero anyway, and they triggered the hidden cutscene so everybody can see it. Just Google it. It's, it's online. Um, but disarmament within the game has yet to be achieved. And I think this is really interesting because game designer Kojima Hideo made the game this way on purpose, right? And his idea was it would make people really think about what it means to possess nuclear weapons and also think about what it takes to get full disarmament. Um, it's a great example of manipulation rules being used to make the player experience the ideology of the game for themselves. 
So I've just given you five ways in which we can learn about Japanese culture from games. We've looked at character design, uh, the background environment, aesthetic choices and conventions. We looked at thematic content and some gameplay dynamics and goals. All of these convey attitudes, ideas, values and messages from the game designers. Some of them are conscious and some of them are not. These are also related to the context in which the games were made. So, just as we read Kokoro for insight into Japanese masculinity or the role of the individual at the close of the Meiji period, uh, I think we can look to Cloud Strife and Solid Snake as examples of the fractured individual at the close of the 20th century. My main point in writing the book, Japanese Culture Through Video Games, was to show that games and gameplay join a broader Japanese discourse and that games tell us a lot about their cultural context. So maybe now, if we go back to our Japanese study syllabus, when we think about using artistic work to understand Japanese culture, we can include video games among those books and films and so on. Um, I'm hoping that through my work, more people will recognize video games as an art form and a cultural artifact with a lot to tell us about Japan and Japanese culture. I thank you everybody for coming along today, especially if it's snowing. Um, and you can reach me via these channels. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Professor Hutchinson, for a really wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it.